Well, hello and welcome wherever you are and whenever you're watching to uh, our, our active online worship uh, here from uh, St Nick's in Beverly. My name's Mike Peaton, I'm the vicar here at St Nick's and it's lovely to have you viewing our service. Uh, many people watching will be St Nick's members because that's uh, uh, they'll be aware of this, but if you've tuned in at some other time, uh, it's good to have you along. Uh, Normally, uh, the, the worship will be coming from church, obviously, and we've been recording services in church over the, uh, the summer. But just at the moment, uh, we're not actually having holding services in church. and It was just easier and more convenient on this occasion to do something here from the vicarage. Today, we'll be looking at the parable of the talents and thinking about uh, what it means. And it's got one or two little mysteries attached to it. So we'll be exploring those uh, in a few minutes time. But first... We're going to open with some prayer. So let's pray. Lord, speak to us that we may hear your word. Move among us that we may behold your glory. Receive our prayers that we may learn to trust you. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world and knows our every word and deed. So let us then open ourselves to the Lord and confess our sins in penitence and faith. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us for behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. May Almighty God, who promises to forgive all who truly repent, forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness and keep us in eternal life. Amen. And the special prayer for today, the second Sunday before Advent. Heavenly Lord, you long for the world's salvation. Stir us from apathy, restrain us from excess, and revive us in new hope that all creation will one day be healed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Our reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 14. Jesus said, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and then trusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who'd received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who'd received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even... What they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I wonder if you're thinking there's something wrong with that parable. We love an underdog, don't we? And uh, you know, when little teams play a big one in the FA Cup and win, all the neutrals cheer. It makes the headlines and we Look to see if they get Manchester United in the, in the next round. So all of those stars have to change, you know, in a, in a funny porter cabin instead of the probably more luxurious changing rooms that they're used to. We even call results like that giant killing. And of course, that's got echoes of the story of David and Goliath. A young child, a young man at least, defeating the allegedly huge warrior in his armour. It's the ultimate story of an underdog. So when it comes to Jesus telling a parable, we expect him to do the same. And he usually does. You know, when the self-righteous Pharisee and the dodgy tax collector go to pray, it's the tax collector who's justified and you kind of cheer. You know? <laughs> when Jesus tells the story of the man who's ambushed on the road to Jericho, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, of course it's the holy walk past and it's the Samaritan who stops and shows compassion. Surely Jesus is going to bring down the man who has given the most and he's bound to, you know, stand up for the, the, the who only had one and was really a bit frightened and a bit intimidated by his boss. Surely that's the way it should go. It should be the man who, with the five talents that gets it wrong and is sent away, not the little guy. And we're disappointed that that's not how this parable goes. And over the years, I've had several people Say that to me. Now, first of all, we need to clear up a confusion in the story about the word talent. In English, we use that word to describe a skill or an ability, something like that. But in here, it's a translation of the Greek word talentom, which means a unit of exchange. And there's debate about exactly how much it's worth. But some ancient sources say it's anything up to 6,000 denarii. Now, a denarius was a day's wage. So that's 6,000 days wage and allowing for sabbath off that's uh, that's about 20 years pay so one talent is 20 years pay hold that thought before we move on jesus is illustrating his story with huge sums of money they're genuinely massive and this parable is also a, a sequence that you get in matthew where the parables about the kingdom 
and uh, they're all about waiting in one way or another. Before we had this, we had parables about uh, the homeowner and the thief. That's an encouragement to be watchful, uh, keep a lookout. <laughs> the two servants, it's all about readiness and acting rightly, uh, because if, if you're expecting someone to come, then you, know, you, you should be behaving properly. And the five wise and five foolish virgins, you know, readiness and doing their duty uh, and, and, and being prepared and being properly equipped and ready to act and, and act appropriately. But here the question is how the three slaves used what had been entrusted to them. Now, it's also worth noting that this parable is not making a judgment or well, it's silent really about the issue of slavery in the sense it takes for granted that that's happening in society and it's using it as, a, as an illustration. Uh, I don't see that as an endorsement of that system is simply uh, using something which would be sadly all too familiar to the listeners. So we need to ask the question, well, what went wrong for that third slave? Or perhaps we need to ask the question, uh, what went right for the first two? If we think about those first two slaves, the ones with the five and one with the two talents, uh, again, that's massive amounts of money we're talking about here. Um, they fully embrace the responsibility that they've been given. And they're honest enough to come back and hand back all their returns. Presumably they could have stashed a bit away, but they don't. They head off at once, it says, and being enterprising, they both double their money uh, before, after a long time, their master returns. And they're richly rewarded in, in two ways. The first is that when, when, when they say what they've done, they're entrusted with more. That affirms their skills, their enterprise, and also their character and their honesty. And secondly, we're told that they'll share in their master's joy. And joy is a word in the New Testament, which has got a very, very big, rich meaning to it. It's not just smiling and being happy or cheerful or something. Uh, it's, not an, it's not something which is transient, but it's an enduring contentedness and peace, which means that you can just rest easy. <laughs> if you're a joyful person, you can rest easy and, uh, and have a have a sense of contentedness and peace. It's related to the word grace, actually. Uh, in other words, it's, it's how you feel when you've experienced the fullness of God's grace, God's generous giving. Meanwhile, the man with the one talent, remember him, <laughs> with his 20 years wages, that is, has, got, has done nothing, but he's buried it. Or, well, he's just kept it safe. He's stashed it away. He's done nothing with it. And at the reckoning, it says he simply gives back what he was given. Have, this is, you know, have what is yours. And that leaves us asking why Jesus describes the master as reacting like he did. You know, what is Jesus trying to teach through this story? Remember, a parable is a fiction. It's not, not, it's not actual events, but he's using, he's depicting, it. it's a dramatisation, if you like, of a point that he's wanting to make. So given this drama and given these characters, what, what, are they, what are they teaching us through the narrative? Well, I think, it's, I think there, are, there are a number of things to, to draw. First thing is when the master entrusted the slave with his one talent, there was an expectation that he would do something with it. In that sense, he failed in his responsibilities. He failed in the relationship. I'm entrusting you with this. And? <laughs> and all, all the slaves, he, he buries it and then, sit, then sits on it and does nothing. And so there's a sense in which uh, the great trust placed in him, even, even one talent is great trust, has been let down. Uh, a relationship of, of, of entrustment has been, in a sense, just rejected. Um, and say, no, I'm just going to sit on it. Second thing, given it's a long time, is of course the, the value of the money would, may well have declined. Uh, I don't know what inflation rate was in, uh, in uh, you know, early first century Judea, <laughs> but no, the, the odds are that it would have, would have declined in value. This man made no attempt to maintain the value even. Um, so in that sense, he's, he's taking value away from what's been entrusted to him. Uh, as the master says at the reckoning, you, you could have got interest from the bankers. Now, uh, Jews were, were forbidden from usury, um, which is usually a regarded as lending with interest, but there were exceptions. So they could lend with interest to non-Jews. And uh, we know later from some Jewish writings that they could, they could lend at reasonable interest rates to fellow Jews, as long as they weren't in any sense exploitative. Uh, otherwise that was usury. 
so that a, a distinction uh, is drawn between the two. Um, and Roman law actually set the interest rate at 12% as a max. Well, that was the maximum. And uh, some credit card companies could probably uh, learn from that. So just by burying the, the money, <laughs> this, this man has effectively lost his master money. Not There's the decline in value and there's the loss of interest. So you know, it cuts both ways that this uh, he could, even by doing very little, have given his master a lot more back. But his master also calls him lazy. He, now, the certain claims he's, he's in action is out of fear, but when he returns the money, he just says, have it back. Uh, the trust placed in him should have affirmed him and valued him and built him up. He's obviously not used to carrying a lot of responsibility. That's why his master didn't give him as much as the others, but he's given him some and said, you know, look after it for me. This was an opportunity for him to show what he could do. Uh, and that trust should have enabled him to uh, flourish. But not many slaves get breaks like that. <laughs> not many slaves are entrusted with that sort of responsibility in the ancient world. But he is. But he didn't even try. And that seems to me to be the biggest condemnation in, the, in this story, that he didn't even try. There's a sense in which you, by the end of the parable, you have this sense where you think, well, the master would have been kinder to him and more affirming of him and more positive about him if he'd had a go and made a mess of it. Uh, it's the fact that he didn't even make any attempt. He simply buried it in the ground. Because after all, the master seems to have been surprisingly generous and gracious to the other two, even though the third servant says, you're a harsh man. It feels like he's making excuses for his inaction rather than genuinely uh, depicting his master's character because his master in action is more gracious than the description. So the, the third servant ends up outside. Now we should notice that he isn't beaten, he isn't tortured and there are no demons pricking him with pitchforks. Uh, it's the main point about wailing and gnashing of teeth that the, the darkness he's, he's, he's shut outside he's no longer in the lit room enjoying uh, sharing in his master's joy a man who had a long time to prove himself uh, um, and uh, make a kind of uh, make some sort of attempt to build on what was entrusted to him that, that would have made the difference for his outcome has, uh, has gone and in that sense he's in hell of his own making He's got, he's, he's racked with regrets. If only I had. Uh, we've all been there in, in, so, in some way or other. So we have some empathy with this chap. Um, but that's, that's the contrast that Jesus is drawing in this kind of dramatized and stylized, really, way of describing uh, how people respond and how people might uh, respond to the responsibilities that God entrusts to us. Because this is a parable. It's not a history. It's not a report. It's not uh, an account of actual events. Uh, and it is stylized deliberately in order to dramatize a point, as I said earlier on. Jesus told it. Matthew preserved it to encourage and challenge us. So what does it say in conclusion? It says the Christian life is and was never about waiting passively around for Jesus to, to come and to turn up. Well, you know, We'll, we'll welcome him when he gets here, but in the, in the meantime. And in the early church, there was a very strong expectation that Jesus would come very, very soon. So there was some evidence that Christians were quite literally sitting around waiting for it to happen. And and actually, Jesus uh, in this parable is saying, don't, don't do that. You know, develop yourselves. You know, continue to grow as people. Continue to flourish as people. And that means engaging with who you are, what you are, what's been entrusted to you, and expressing that in the context of the world around you. We've all got much entrusted to us in many kinds of ways. I think this parable asks us, are we afraid to try? Do we fear failure? Or are we going to embrace whatever opportunities we're presented with to use, to develop, and to grow all that God 
has entrusted to us in faith that we will share his joy. Amen. So let's pray. As we think of those uh, three men depicted in that story of Jesus, let's bring before God the skills, the abilities, the talents which we possess. Father, we pray that we may use all that you've entrusted to us in many different ways. Help us to fulfil all that you made us to be and help us to build your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. As we think of our wider world, we're aware of many different concerns, particularly the coronavirus uh, crisis, where people are still being infected at great rates and many people are still dying or becoming seriously ill. We pray for all involved in their treatment and care. We pray for all who are working hard to ensure that a safe vaccine may be available and new treatments may be developed. Be with all who are working so hard to ensure our safety and security, and give those who govern us wisdom to know the right decisions to make as to what restrictions should be applied. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are fearful and frightened, for those who feel isolated because communal life and meeting together is so restricted. We pray for any who are feeling particularly broken in body, mind or spirit. We pray that they may be kept safe, that they may be encouraged and help us to know how we can support those around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our local community, wherever we may be, for those who surround us, for those who live or work or study near where we are. We pray for all, for their varied needs, for their families, for their friendships, for their well-being. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for the life of the church. Here in Beverly, we pray for our own parish and for all the local parishes and other churches of other denominations with whom we share fellowship and ministry. We pray that we may all be strengthened in this difficult and testing time that we're going through at the moment. And we pray that we may be faithful witnesses to the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. All these prayers we bring together in, the, in his name. Amen. So we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So thank you for joining us uh, for this worship. And I hope that uh, you may be able to join us again, uh, perhaps uh, next week or some uh, other date in the future. Over the next two or three weeks, we're going to be, um, we're going to be, uh, unable to have an organised act of worship in church, although church will be open for personal prayer on Sundays and Wednesdays from 9.30. And then hopefully uh, in uh, in early December, we'll be able to be back in church for corporate worship and a recording of that will be placed online. Otherwise, everything else is uh, uh, online at the moment. So we've got one or two things happening on Zoom. Uh, including coffee after after our morning service time at 11.30 on a Sunday uh, and a quiz uh, once a month and uh, one or two other things happening. So do keep in touch with us on our website. We'll put the website address on at the end of this video and uh, I hope that uh, you keep safe and well uh, in the meantime. So to conclude, we say the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.